James. Thank you, James. Good evening, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. It's one of my favorite places in the world, and I couldn't be happier to be speaking to Patrick. We have lots to discuss. Lots. Yeah, lots to discuss, <laughs> and I know we're gonna, uh, we have lots to cover from where you began to where you are now. I think we should just speak really in chronological order, but I do want to talk first about the Shoes, Pleasure and Pain exhibition that's on here, because you actually have one of your pieces in the exhibition. So can you just tell us a little bit about what, what, what you have here? I think they've probably got my most iconic thing. The thing that people most know me for is the wannabe loafer. Um, it's a shoe that I started to design in 1992. It started off as very small and then became huge and became the biggest part of my business. So they've got a pair of white patent, I believe, loafers downstairs. Um, How does that feel? How does it feel? And do they call you up and say, do they tell you what they want? Well, or? Not telling tales, but I didn't even know this thing was on. I saw okay. a poster in Soho with my shoes on, and I went, what's that for? And then I called the VA and the VNA up, and I said, hi, um, do you want me to do anything? Do you okay. have something of mine? I've given over the years, I'm, I don't know, probably 80 pairs of shoes to the VNA. Um, every year, we'd let them come in and choose something. There, I think there are two pairs of mine on permanent exhibition in the clothing gallery. Nice. And then, you know, I said, do you need anything? They said, no, we've got lots to choose from. So it was just a surprise what they chose. And have you got a big archive of your own of things that you've done? That was my I do. question to you. Um, in your own wardrobe or is it in some special storage? Uh, Neither. It, it's in some hideous lockup by Heathrow. Okay. Uh, and this is the glamour of fashion. Yeah, no, this no. This is what we're going to get from Patrick. It's the reality behind the glamour. It, it, it was really quite a big... There's a, there's a big shoe exhibition going on at an art gallery, uh, no, a fashion museum in Antwerp right now, and I had to give them access to the archive. And I hadn't been to it since I left Patrick Cox, the company, in 2007. So um, it was quite a depressing situation because they were covered in dust, there'd been a leak, some of the shoes were wrecked. But it was quite exciting because some of the things I hadn't seen since the 90s, I mean, since they were literally designed. Um, they wanted to film it, but unfortunately there was lots of teary moments behind boxes, me just crying, <laughs> looking at things, whatever. <laughs> so we didn't film it, thank God. Um, but yeah, it's still there. It's, it's in a better state after the two days that we had working on it, but it still isn't digitally archived and all that stuff that it should be. Okay, so going back, from, for a designer who has shoes on display in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which is obviously a huge accolade, let's go back to where you began, how you got into this whole industry, and who was the biggest inspiration for you when you were young? Was your mother some crazy shoe wearer or anything like that? I, you know, no, none of that. My, my, I was brought up in Canada and Africa. We moved to Nigeria when I was two, um, and then Cameroon and then Chad. Um, I don't really Why? have any... Why? Well, my father's a linguist. My father... Okay. Uh, he's a bit of a pot-smoking hippie, dragged us all over the world in the 60s till my mother divorced him. Uh, <laughs> she was like, enough, <laughs> enough of this. <laughs> Let's go back to Canada, which I was very depressed about because Africa was obviously nice and hot, and where I'm from in Edmonton was 30 below zero for probably 90 days of the year minimum. So it was quite a dramatic change. My first memory of footwear is, do you remember the band Kiss? I was obsessed with these dragon boots that Gene Simmons, the, the lead singer, wore. And that was my first shoe memory, lusting after these boots. And the Bay City Rollers, I kind of really honestly wanted those um, tartan shoes very badly. So those are my first shoe memories. We lived in Africa. We used to come to England in the 60s and 70s during the summer to avoid the heat. And one of my biggest shoe memories also was being a child, and it was the time of platforms and Donny Osmond, and being on the tube and reading an article about these women falling down the subway stairs at the, at the, in the tube, you know, miles and miles and miles because of wearing these platforms. So all my footwear memories are platforms, and from the 70s, that's where I became aware of it, really. Okay, so you moved to London from Canada. Well, I, I left home when I was 16. Then I moved to Toronto, and I lived in Toronto for two years. Uh, my family's all very academic, and I was supposed to go study at university, all that sort of thing. Um, I started to go to nightclubs, and then I started to really go to nightclubs and quite like it and enjoy it. Um, and on, your, then, on your Wikipedia page, it says, uh, Patrick spent as, much, he spent as much time in nightclubs as he did designing shoes. I probably spent more time in clubs back in the 80s than I did designing <laughs> shoes. We redressed that balance now, but probably okay. back in the day. Then I worked for, then I was the doorman of a trendy club called Voodoo. Um, I wasn't the big guy at the back, I was the boy at the clipboard with the clipboard at the front, and you were either cool or trendy or whatever, you know, the usual like 
nightclubs. The one that everyone wanted to be yeah. friends with. Yeah, so, so I had that. Then I got hired by a Canadian designer who was one of Canada's biggest designers at the time called Lucas, and he just wanted me around. I couldn't cut a pattern. I hadn't been to fashion school. I couldn't draw, but they just liked the way I look. I was sort of a muse before there was a muse. Um, then he asked me to be in charge of the fashion show, and this is before the day of stylists. The, 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 word, the job stylist didn't really exist in 1981. And I was in charge of hair, makeup, casting, and accessories. Canada doesn't really have a footwear industry other than like snowmobile boots or something like that. <laughs> so, um, do you remember those horrible kung fu slippers that cost like a dollar? That have a thin sole and elastic on each side? So I went to Chinatown, I bought a pair of those. I was really obsessed with like Claude Montana or Thierry Mugler or something like that. So I made boots to here out of these little $1 Kung Fu slippers. And they were in the show. Um, the show went well. I don't remember any flash of lightning from God or anything like that. But my friend said, you seem to really enjoy that. I heard of this shoe college in London, blah, blah, blah. The only word I heard in that whole sentence was London. Um, <laughs> and that was 83 in May, and by September 83, I was moved to London and going to Cordwainers College. I could have been staring at anything. I could have been staring at hats. I could be a hat designer. I could have really been doing anything. It was just about being in London at that moment. It was the, um, the time of, what was it called? The Second British Invasion, we called it in, in North America. It was Spandau Ballet, Duran Duran, Culture Club, Rhythmics, all of that, when everybody was, you know, new romantics. Mm -hmm. So um, I moved to London in, Hackney. Um, I didn't live in Hackney. I lived in Belgravia, but I went to college every day in Hackney. Very important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Big difference. Crucial information. <laughs> and that's when Hackney was not quite so Hoxton call Hackney that it is today. That's when it was a ghetto. And it was really quite <laughs> exciting. Um, I ate lunch every day at McDonald's just because it was the only thing I knew what it was. Because I remember going into a pub. I have and to say, in the 80s, as a child, I think I did too. We were all in the McDonald's all the time. Well, you just went in, and I said, they'd say to the lady behind the pub, I'd like a cheese sandwich. And I was like, what type of cheese? And she'd go, cheese, cheese. I was like, <laughs> OK, I'll go back to McDonald's. Right. Um, so I supposedly was there studying very hard. But as you know, I was spending a lot of time in nightclubs. Um, Lee Bowery had this amazing club on Thursdays called Taboo. Um, and I had a class called Materials on Friday mornings. Um, and on the last day of school, <laughs> in the first year, I got caught in the hallway by this man and he said, who are you? And I went, Patrick Cox. And he goes, oh, I'm the teacher of Materials. You've never been once in the entire year. So he took me to an office and made me take these tests and threatened to fail me. And it wasn't really that hard. I mean, you had to learn how to make glue from scratch. And I said, don't you just buy it? <laughs> I mean, do I really need to kill a horse and boil it? And, make glue, but <laughs> it was that basic. Okay. Uh, and then in my first year of college, I ended up doing the shoes for Vivian Westwood. Um, again, it's nightclubs. How, How did that happen? Because that's a big, big deal. <laughs> yeah, more nightclubs. Uh, it was New Year's Eve between 1983 and 1984. It was three in the morning at a speakeasy in Soho called the Pink Pussycat. And in the loo, I met uh, the entire Vivian Westwood team. They were holding court, as awesome. you do, in the loo in 1983. And I used to shop in Vivian's store. I mean, Vivian was probably 50% of the reason I moved to England. I was obsessed with Vivian. You couldn't get Vivian's clothes in Canada. So I, they came up to me and they said, oh, we like you. You're that American boy that shops in our store. And I went, Canadian. And they went, OK. And, and that was, without sounding pathetic, one of the most amazing, accepting moments, well, especially at that point in my life that I'd ever had. Then we became friends. Uh, Vivian's show was supposed to be March 1984 in New York, uh, sorry, in Paris. Uh, in those days, that's when Malcolm and Vivian just had broken up and Malcolm had left and done whatever he was doing. There's a lot of rumors of what Vivian and Malcolm did and a lot of people in Vivian's camp and Malcolm's camp. Malcolm did the styling, Malcolm did the accessories, Malcolm did the music, Malcolm did the casting, Vivian did the clothes. And it was six weeks before the show, and they realized they had no shoes, because they'd kind of forgotten about it. Um, Vivian's assistant said, oh, I know this guy, Patrick. He knows what to do. Well, I was an idiot. I was in my first year of college. I had no idea what to do, but I bluffed it. I went in and I had a meeting with Vivian. Um, they had no heat. They had no electricity, because she was so broke. Um, they, had, they could only take cash in the store, because they had no telephones. Um, so I ended up doing the shoes for Vivian which I paid for because she had no money to pay for the shoes. I had to lie to the factory because otherwise it was this little cobbler on um, 
in, where is it, in Camden. Uh, and I couldn't say it was for Vivian because she had so much money to him. Okay. So I ended up getting the shoes done. Uh, it was more a collaboration. She had an idea of a shoe that she wanted to do, and I just sort of said, what about this, what about this, what about this? She said, fine, go for it. Then on my own, I don't know, I felt quite gutsy, I made these three gold platforms with three big knots. Not high platforms, but at that time, there was nothing like that, so like a four-inch platform. I paid for my own train to Paris. I showed up in Vivian's horrible little hotel room where everybody was crowded around. We unpacked the shoes, and then I pulled out the gold platforms. And I'll never forget that she went, ooh, how hideous, how 70s. Really? <laughs> Coming from the woman who was now the most known platform designer in the world, it was, it was, and I was quite crestfallen, and I said, okay, fine, it's not gonna happen. And then uh, the next day, everything arrives for the show. Well, everything supposedly arrives for the show. The show's already an hour late, no clothes. Then this truck arrives from Italy, and initially, they're unloading clothes. Then it's bales of fabric and then sewing machines and they just push them off. Basically told Vivian, get stuffed and drove off. And we're like, what? So we had to go out into the audience and find designers. And we found like Stephen Jones, John Galliano, John Flett. And went, In the audience of the show. Come backstage and sew. You're so the clothes. Are you joking? <laughs> no, 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 I'm not joking at all. People think, you know, these glamorous ideas, but it was that, that basic and there was no money. Uh, and then Jean Krell, who used to run Vivian Westwood, started singing, trying to entertain people. Then Anna Wintour <laughs> left, two hours late at this point. David, who was Vivian's assistant and her, started to fight because they were just so stressed. And do you know the mini Crinny collection? Everything kind of looked like a lampshade. So they had a fight and Vivian said, you help me. So I'm trying to style things and I'm going, is this a skirt? Is it a hat? I mean, you know, I don't know what it is. And we got one outfit for each girl, and then we just threw everything in the back of the room in a pile. And I said to every girl, when you get off the stage, dress yourself in something else. Because, <laughs> and somehow, and it wasn't me, the gold platforms got thrown in that pile. There were three pairs. And the girls would come off the runway and fight over the gold platforms. So the gold platforms ended up going out about 20 times, even though they weren't even supposed to be in the show. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Beginning of career! Yeah, <laughs> and obviously in the audience, because they finished sewing and went back out front, there was John Galliano and all the people that would eventually be the, the new generation of English designers. So I ended up doing John's shoes for the next seven seasons and et cetera, et cetera. So that was the beginning. So when, and that was while, while you were at Cordwain? That was my first year. They threatened to fail me. What were your, your Because peers I missed three weeks of school. You. Pardon? Your peers must have hated you. They didn't know what I was doing. Okay. I mean, Cordwainers okay. now, they have 500 people show up in the hallway and have CVs. Yeah. I got accepted because I was paying the foreign student fee. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't draw. I didn't know a thing. I didn't know who Manola was. The first article about me in the face called me the new Manolo Blahnik, and I was going Manala, Manila. <laughs> I, was, I didn't know. I didn't know where Dr. Martens were because they don't exist in Canada. So, and in, in, in your course at the time, were there any people who have got, you know, were there any kind of big names that went on to do big things? Emma Hope was the year above me. Okay. Um, and then John Moore was the year above me, who was very good. He unfortunately passed away about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. There was, we were called the Cord Winners 6, the Cord Winners 7. Because even though they were a year above me, we all kind of came out at the same time. Mm. Most of us have stopped. And what were you all wearing? I just, I love your take on culture of the time. Were you, were you like in frilly shirts and adamant okay. makeup every day? Okay, well, take the tube from, what is it, from Hyde Park Corner. At Liverpool Street, anyone decently dressed who didn't look homeless got off. And then it was just scary to Bethnal Green. <laughs> <laughs> Bethnal Green, you'd have to run to the bus stop and not get mugged and then get the, get attack, get the, two, the bus to Cordwainers. It was, you know, the look hard times. Everybody wore Levi's, rolled up, Dr. Martin's white socks and uh, the flight jacket. And I would be head to toe Vivian Westwood regalia. I had long curly blonde hair. I had, you know, you know, the three-tongue sneaker, things trailing behind me, whatever. I don't know how I made it out of their life. Okay. Um, and then this, after they threatened to fail me, and the second year they threatened to fail me, and then because of what I'd done, then if they had a local dignitary, like the Lord Mayor of Hackney would come visit, then they would point at me and say, note the garb. Um, and I okay. always thought that was a good name for a book one day. Yeah. Note the garb. Note the garb. And then they, when I was, it's a two-year course and you graduate, then it was an optional third year. And because I was paying foreign student fees, and I didn't really do anything but go to nightclubs the whole time I was in school, I just thought the money I would have spent on the third year, I'll just spend on launching my company. Okay. So everything I did during college, 
I mean, the, the projects were terrible. He was like, design a shoe for a 60-year-old woman with bunions, and the prize was <laughs> you want to work a week on the end of the production line at Clark's. I was like, I don't want the prize, and I don't want, and I don't want anything yeah. to do with this. Yeah. So I'd be drawing Steve Laurent stilettos or whatever the hell I'd be designing, okay. and I would lose every single competition. And at the end of the second year, they're like, you'll be back. You never did anything. And I went, yeah. And it took about a decade, and then they started to list me on the prospectus as a guest speaker, but they've never really had the guts to ask me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. The irony is for me, I won an award with Vivian Westwood when I was at school, and in 1994, then I, went to, I was working for her at that time. So I could have ended up in Paris with you. Sadly, I didn't. I ended no. up with 400 Japanese students. Darling, 84. Oh, 84. Yeah, you're, you're a little bit younger. Oh, yeah, you're 94. a little bit younger. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay, so you left Cord Wainers, and then you went and set up Patrick Cox. And you, and that was your label of, of Patrick Cox, and Patrick Cox wannabe became, came after that, right? Yeah, we graduated July 85, had a stand at London Fashion Week, two by three meters, covered the walls in navy blue felt, had my little flow de lis thing, because I was obsessed with French history. I had, I think, eight styles on offer, which were all things that were rejects from all the competitions I'd lost. Um, and I think we sold 400 pairs the first season. Then the next season we sold 800 pairs, and then it just slowly grew from that. Then in 1992, I was doing the shoes. I pretty well did half of British Fashion Week because there was no other cobbler. So I was doing John Galliano, John Flett, Astrid Blair, Workers and for Freedom. And when you do that, are you meeting with a designer? How much in advance at the time were you meeting with a designer to decide what they wanted? Or do they just bring you up that week? Well, in all honesty, I had a bigger turnover than most of them. And in all honesty, none of them ever paid me. <laughs> so I was just, I'd say, do you want this from what I'm doing? Okay. Except John and I were great friends for, for quite a long period back then. We used to always go to Taboo together. Mm. Um, we would always party with Lee Bowery together back in the days. So him and I would actually more coordinate than the rest of them. But a lot of the time it was just, you know, this is what I did. Does it work for you? And how did you start? You had a store on Sloane Street, which I remember very, very well. They used to have queues outside it. Even Victoria Beckham says that she used to queue outside your store for shoes. I know. Well, her and her sister shared their first pair of wannabes because it was her first Spice Girl check and she didn't actually know if there was going to be a second one. <laughs> so they split it and shared it. I mean, it was hilarious. It's quite a mean story, but um, my hit thing was wannabe and their first song was wannabe. And whoever was their manager at the time thought it was a genius idea to link this up. And they sent us this video <laughs> of these five lumpy girls jumping around on stage. <laughs> it, was, it was a really, really early, early, early shot in the studio. And I was like, God, no, no way. Uh, and then That's when hilarious. the wannabe years started and we became famous, our wannabe, their wannabe, all the staff had to wannabe t-shirts. And then one day they just went on strike and said, we leave and we have 14 year old girls just chasing us down the street. Can we please stop wearing these t-shirts? Really? So the whole wannabe thing came about um, I was doing my shoes that I was doing. We sold a lot during the winter and less in the summer because English shoes are quite sturdy and substantial. And I wanted to do something more lightweight, Italian, more moccasin-y. Um, everybody in London that time was, Gucci was practically a bankrupt company, but some very cool people like Kim Hunt at English L and Marcus Van Ackerman were going in and buying these kind of old retro Gucci shoes. And I liked the Gucci loafer, but to me it was very feminine. It was lightweight, thin sole, almost women's like suede. So I ended up doing one that was square toe, thicker leather, thicker sole, and it wasn't low cut, it had an elastic, it was high cut. And the first season, we sold you know, a thousand pairs, and then it sold a little bit more. And normally in my level at that point, we never repeated anything, because it was just dead the second season, people wanted fashion. But with this, it kind of got a following and then started growing. Then we had an Italian factory that was starting to copy us. Then they called me and asked me if I would design something for them. And instead of being all young designery and going, no, you know, I'm suing you or whatever. And I just said to them, well, why don't you stop doing the copy? I'll stop doing the original. And we worked together. And that was the birth of Wannabe. Uh, the name was because everybody at that time was doing CK or they were doing DKNY or they were doing Junior. You, you know, you weren't paying enough, mon enough money to get the whole name. So to me, you were a wannabe. You were a wannabe someone who has 250 pounds a pair, which is what Patrick Cox cost at the time, but you weren't. You were someone that had 80 pounds a pair. So that was the birth of it. The first season, we thought we'd sell 10,000. We sold 25,000. Within 18 months, we were selling a quarter million pairs a season. And then it very quickly went up to over a million pairs. Um, and, and that's where the lineups came. That's where all the 
insanity came and there was even some university in America was doing a marketing course on me I went we just it happened I really? would love to say that we planned it and did it but it just to anyone happened. who's new to that whole the, the, the culture around wannabe just take us back a little bit to that time of what was going on apart from the Spice Girls what was going on was there quite an androgynous thing going on or was it very much it was called Britannia it was okay. and people were dancing and sweating and going to nightclubs and going out and wannabe was a really great transitional shoe between wearing a sneaker and then selling out and getting a job in the city and wearing Oxfords so it was just a and it was a great comfort shoe to wear um, I remember it was Arena Magazine or was it the face of reviewed clubs by how many pairs of wannabes you saw on the floor okay. you know it wasn't a cool club if there wasn't like 80 pairs and things like that I mean, I wish I could relive those times <laughs> in a lot of ways because <laughs> I didn't really realize they were happening at the time. It just, it just happened. Um, my favorite thing to do was to just go sit in the cafe in Portobello Road and just count. And when I got to about 150 pairs, I'd be like, okay, cool day. I can go home now. Who knew that that wasn't normal? <laughs> and your store in London, you had a security guard on the door. Junior. Junior. Junior the bouncer. Yeah. He used to make me wait just a minute just to be rude. Yeah. And then he asked my PR if she could do his PR. And she goes, what do you do? And he goes, well, I'm getting all this press. She goes, because you're standing in front of Patrick's store. You're not really getting press. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing. People would stand three hours. German what MTV were they, what would... What were they queuing for? They were queuing for wannabe shoes. Were they, were they, were they, did you run out? Or did you make sure that you ran out? So oh, God, there no. Was there was demand? no marketing. There was no hype. Well, first of all, to get through South London, most of the trucks got stolen because it was a very much pre-Burberry. There was a lot of gangsters who liked what we did. Okay. So they would just steal the whole freaking truck. Uh, they wouldn't even bother coming into the store. We'd have a guy came into the store, chose a pair, went back outside, put a, put a motorcycle helmet on, and then came in with a knife. And he went, I want those in size 37. We're like, you were just in here. <laughs> We, we know who you are. <laughs> I mean, like, what? <laughs> it was, yeah, it was Did interesting. this really happen? Oh, yeah, really yeah, yeah. We had guys go pop, pop, and the briefcase would open. It would just be full of money. And oh, I want that one, I want that one, I want that one. I'm like, cool. Crazy. Yeah, it was a different time. And I, I also, um, I read that in Japan, everyone was, I mean, as much as you loved Vivian Westwood, and Vivian Westwood had a cult status in Japan. Yeah. For you then, how did they get to know about you? Because obviously we live in a such a different world now where you can look online. But for you to be just in Sloane Street, and then you opened up in Paris, and you opened up in New York, and then you had such a huge thing, you did a whole deal with Isitan. Isitan, yeah. How did that happen? Just, Vivian is a god in Japan, so just by my association with Vivian, really? I was already cool. I'm proverbially big in Japan. I mean, I think it's the only place in the world I think where I can sign an autograph anywhere else. No one would ever even think of that. But in Japan, there's such a level of research and fandom they really get into something if they like it so um it just grew from there the i remember the opening day when we opened when this attend um they had fifty thousand pair order i'll never forget that i mean who orders fifty thousand pairs of shoes and ray cow kubo from come to galson came and stood and watched it the whole you know come to galson team all wore my shoes it wasn't just a math thing it wasn't just a gangster thing it, it kind of transcended every single level it went from 14-year-old kids wanting to wear it to school, making their parents buy them for them, to Chelsea pensioners because their feet felt nice in them. It really did cross everything at the time. Okay, so from there, we're now going to talk about where you're at now, which is with your new brand called Lathbridge. Yes. Take us through how you went from Patrick Cox with people queuing up outside your door for those shoes to um, you then sold your name or your company, I don't know how you would say that, and then you had a bit of a, a time when you, you, the three years you talked about when yeah. you weren't allowed to do anything. Yeah, so, um, when did this all go? How do we say this properly? So the, the glory years, let's say, of my career, hopefully there'll be more glory years, but the ones that have happened so far were 90, 95 to about 2002, that's when I could sort of do no wrong, let's say. Then um, the people who made Wannabe, uh, we had the deal with them, had problems with their own, and he ended up closing. So we tried to seg everything into Patrick Cox and just do Patrick Cox. Everybody at that time, it was the arrival of the supergroups. Um, fashion was very much, in England, a co cottage industry, let's say, before that. I mean, I didn't even have an overdraft at the bank, because even going into the bank, they would just be like, oh, you're in fashion? you know, get out right. sort of thing. So I was always cash in the bank. I'd never met my bank manager. Everything was just growing, growing, growing. And then it was the time of Prada, Gucci, Louis Vuitton arriving, and these super groups just changing the landscape. And then I saw what Tamara Mellon was starting to do with Jimmy Choo. 
and everybody was saying, you know, Patrick, you're opening one, two stores a year, but you should be doing 20, 30 stores a year. So, um, and I blame myself for this, I listened to the siren song of people saying, you should be, you should be, you should be, and look what everyone else is doing. So we got in investors, this was about 2002. Um, they turned out to be the wrong investors. <laughs> and we- Were they British? British, yes. Um, it was the night before we signed the deal, and the man called me up and he said, I've created a vehicle and I'm bringing five friends along for the ride. I, went, I don't even know what that meant. But it turns out he was bringing four friends along to be invest with him. Unfortunately, at board meetings, they would be at that end fighting. And me and my CEO would be at the other end going, you know, what do we do? What do we do? So after about a year and a half of them getting us to spend on a level that I would never have approved, getting us to do things that I personally wouldn't have agreed with, um, they said, we should exit. We're not helping the company. And I said, yeah. So then we got a second set of investors um, who did have the minority of the company, but um, through various ways of doing things, whatever, ended up with the majority of the company. And that's where things started to really go wrong. Um, they just didn't treat, I don't really mind what they did with me. I, I, I'm a big boy, but they didn't treat the staff properly. They didn't treat the factories properly. They didn't treat like, sort of anyone properly. Um, and famously, on Patrick Cox's letter addressed to Patrick Cox, the man wrote to me, what can you do for my brand? And I just said, I can quit. Um, so in 2007, I, I, I left Patrick Cox. It's not the Tamara Melden 150 million pound story. It's a slightly different version of that one, but I left. I had a three year non-compete. I spent three years just kind of regrouping, just thinking, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? Then I probably had a midlife crisis. Did anyone go to my cupcake store? Cox Cookies and Cake? <laughs> <laughs> midlife crisis, there you go. So. Patrick I, had this amazing cupcake shop called Cox Cookies and Cake, which I actually wrote about on Daily Candy, <laughs> um, this website that I ran at the time, and it was in Soho. Let's talk a little bit about the cupcakes, because it's okay. fun. The cupcake store was in Soho, and all your an staff were in like studded black leather bow ties, and it was the... My mother baked for me every Saturday morning when I was a child, and I had a friend stay with me for a week and stayed six months, and she said, what can I do to make Patrick happy? And my mother said, bake. So this very good friend of mine learned how to do all these Canadian recipes, cupcakes, Nanaimo bars, what all sorts of things. And so I decided, in my moment of madness in, in 2010, <laughs> to open a cupcake store. But be, me being me, it had to be Cox Cookies and Cake, it had to be Risqué, it was in an ex-sex shop in Soho, it was all black with mirrors. My friend Jono designed it, who's sitting over there. <laughs> and it, most people were terrified to walk into it because they thought it was a sex shop. And, <laughs> and because we did titty cakes and ass cakes and cock cakes and we did, you know, we had a very good Soho offer. Um, and that was fun, but in all honesty, you make a thousand pounds a month, which is really not that exciting at the end of the day after what I had been doing before. So then in 2011, I got a phone call from Geox. I don't know if you know Geox. They're not as known in England, but they're the third biggest shoe company in the world. Um, I don't know, billion euro turnover, 21 million pairs a year, quite big, quite big competitor to Clark's who were doing the shoe show, so shh. And they, um, they called me up and asked me to work for them. The two things I did not want to do in my point was set foot in Italy ever again or design shoes. But they were quite persistent um, and I was, they were kind of masochistic because they said, what do you think of us? And I said, I think you do the ugliest shoes in the world and I've never been in your store. And I got the job, so that was good. <laughs> so then I started doing that. Then very quickly I realized it was impossible to do the cupcakes and do the shoes for them. So close the cupcakes. I had offers to buy it, but I already had lost control of Patrick Cox. I didn't really want to lose control of Cox Cookies and Cake as well as Patrick Cox. So I just said, no, close it. Then I've been doing j -Ox now. I guess we're in our fourth year working together. I love it. It's great. It's exciting but it is limiting in that I'm designing to a brief, I'm designing to please someone else, and I'm always I'm quite good at being my own boss and pleasing myself. So it's been about three years I've been playing with the idea of, being Lath of doing Lathbridge. Uh, Lathbridge is my middle name. My name is Patrick Lathbridge Cox. It's my great English uncle's last name. The logo is the bulldog, because the love of my life are two British bulldogs who would be here, but they're not allowed in the V&A. Um, Brutus and Caesar. Brutus and Caesar, the name check even. Yeah, there we go. And so then I just had all these ideas that I couldn't do for Geox. I couldn't do, and I just thought I'm going to start my own brand. I'm going to start my own brand. It took three years of 
introspective moments thinking, do I really want to throw my hat in the arena? Do I really want to go back and do all of that again? And the answer is yes. I really, really, really don't want to do that. So, um, Lathbridge, ladies and Lathbridge, gentlemen. Lathbridge, Lathbridge. <laughs> we didn't plan on wearing matching shoes. There you go. No, we didn't plan. So, <laughs> so but with Lathbridge, um, I want you to talk a little bit about the aesthetic, but I also want you to talk about the difference of launching a brand now versus the, different, the difference of launching a brand when you first started with Patrick Cox. What are the differences? What are the different challenges for you? We obviously live in a world of social media, which you didn't have before. Yeah. Is it as important for you to open a store this time, or is it more important that you get Netta Porte, Luisa Via Roma, etc., as stockists. This, the first first season, um, I used to be the best-selling line for about a decade or so. Men's shoes in Harrods or Selfridges, which in the shoe departments there are both owned by a company called Kurt Geiger. So before I even had anything, I went to Kurt I Geiger. I knew that. They yeah, yeah. own the shoe department. Yeah, and Phoenix and Liberties. Really? Yeah, yeah, they got all of it. Oh, <laughs> no wonder there's Kurt Geiger. Yeah, yeah, everywhere. yeah. yeah. Um, so I first of all went to them with the logo and just you know, some price points. And I said, are you ready for this? And they said, we'd love you to come back. Then I went to them six months later with sketches, which I've never done in my entire career. But I was feeling a little insecure because I hadn't done this in a while at that level. And they said, yep, love it. So the first season was supposed to just be for the two of them. Then the factory in Italy said, we're doing all of this work for just one or well, two UK clients. You know? And so I talked to them and they said, whatever you do outside of England, we don't mind. So the first season we were playing a bit catch up. We, um, we delivered six weeks ago to Harris and Selfridges. And so this is, we're going to just quite clarify, this is men's and women's shoes. Uh, the first season, they've only bought the men's. Okay. The idea when I came back was I was going to do men's footwear only. And then about, I don't know, November last year, some of my very dear female friends staged an intervention. I went, we have not listened to you moaning for the last five years to have you only do men's shoes. You're doing women's shoes too. Unfortunately, it was a bit late to do it properly. So the first season, i.e. that sneaker that you have on, comes in men's size as a women's size. There's no red carpet, there's no stilettos, there's no high heels or anything like that. It's, it's a casual line, that's the idea. The idea is to do something, even though it is made in Italy, to do something very British in spirit. I mean, that's why I like the name Lathbridge. It's terribly British, it's like Burberry, Smysons, it's just one word. Um, and even if we are doing sneakers, don't start to do them just in black and white, high tops and all that sort of thing that everybody is used to. Try to use unusual materials. I like everything to have a certain 70s swagger. I like square toes, as we all know from back in the day, so there's some square toe things. And go from a brogue to a sneaker. The idea, hopefully, it will be that it'll be a men's house of accessories with women's shoes in it. I don't want to do women's bags, gloves, scarves. I do want to do that for men. But I think there's something very interesting about a girl woman coming into a man's store and finding something in her size. I think this whole androgyny thing, to me it's not really about men running around in women's clothes, but there is something incredibly sexy about a woman borrowing you know, a man's shirt, you know, getting dressed in her, her boyfriend's or husband's shirt or bear, putting on her husband's jeans or something like that. I quite like that. So it will be essentially a masculine house of accessories, eventually, um, with a women's footwear offer. That's the idea of the brand. And when you say you're not sketching, so through all these years, how, what's been your creative process? How are you actually making shoes? Going to Italy. I mean, that's why are you, I'm... Are you modeling it on a last in front of somebody as you... As I, you I have ideas. I have vignettes like films. Uh, everywhere I sleep in the world, well, before the age of, you know, smartphones, I had a notepad next to my bed, and I would wake up, and I would describe things more than sketch things. I, as I said, I never did fine arts. When I went to Cord Winners, I was accepted because I was paying, because I didn't certainly have a portfolio. And even to this day, my drawings are very technical. They look more like an architect's plan. I mean, I always use the idea of a, a shoe is like architecture, because there's an inside and an outside and a concealed supporting structure. So that is the way I, th I think when I'm looking at something. I try to think of a moment of vignettes, someone who inspires me on the lady side. On the men's side, I'm size eight. The sample size is size eight. Everything gets tried on my foot. If I like it, it's in. If I don't, it's out. It's that simple. We never had a marketing department. We never chased what does a 30-year-old Japanese man do and what does a 50-year-old American want. You know, we never did that. It was just pure design. And how do you regard now the kind of the super brands that you talked about or the super groups with, with the LVMH and the caring and everything? Is that something that you, this is a long way, it will, or not, would you aspire to be a part of those huge conglomerates as a designer, or are you still really happy to remain on your own? What I want to do, all I can do with the rebirth of Lathbridge, you were talking about the, it's a different playing field now, 
there's always someone who's going to do it cheaper than me. So there's no point in going down in price because the high street's so quick at copying. They get access to the photos. They knock you off in a second. And there's always someone who's going to do it on a bigger budget than me with a bigger voice. So what I have to do now coming back is celebrate being niche. I have to be individual. I have to do what I like. And I have to do it my way. And don't get upset if someone's making more noise or don't get upset if someone's you know, doing, knocking me off or something like that. Just stay true to the course. We, we are selling some wholesale. But ideally for me, we will have some sort of store by spring on a secondary street, in a pop-up area, no big marble palaces in the stores that I used to do before. Um, something very real, very honest, and grow from there. Obviously, online will be very important. Um, just try to do something. I don't have any world domination plans. I'm, I'm 52 now. I've probably got 15 years left in my career. I just want to have a nice denouement. I want to do something that I'm really proud of and I enjoy. I don't want to do it to the level I did before where you forgot why you were doing it and you weren't really having fun anymore. To me, I hope, my favorite reaction when people come into the showroom is to smile. I don't want people to say, you've reinvented the wheel. I don't want people to say, oh my God, you know, the word genius is thrown around in fashion way too much for my liking. It's, you know, they're fricking shoes, they're fricking, it's a fricking dress, you know, get over it. So to me, if someone smiles when they come in, that's the best reaction in the world. And which kind of designers now Fashion or accessories, are you interested in who you admire, who you might not consider a genius, but who you, who do you keep up with? Well, the UK ones, my, my two favorite are Nicholas Kirkwood and Sophia Webster. I just think they have a wonderful point of view. They have a pop sensibility. I love what they do. I mean, obviously, eternally Manolo. Manolo's Manolo's Manolo. You know, you just need the one word. He's just such a great artist, a gentleman. Um, as far as quality, not including Manolo, I'd say the best made shoes are Gian Vito Rossi, who is the son of Sergio Rossi. I think he has the most excellent shape and quality for a woman's high heel. Um, I don't try to look at shoes that much because you inevitably being, get inspired. To me, when I'm trying to design, I look at kids' shoes, I look at work shoes, I look at things nothing not related to footwear at all. But if you look at shoes, I remember Vivian used to say it, she would stick it on the board just to make sure she didn't do it. Because you think you're not going to do something and then you're sketching and sketching and all of a sudden it really starts to look like that. And if you don't have it there to so just stare at you and go, no, you'll end up drifting that way. And if in the olden days the Spice Girls and the wannabe song and the wannabe shoes and the <laughs> Spice Girls, Victoria Beckham's cooing at your shop, that was obviously quite exciting. You have had incredible people. I mean, Kylie Minogue and everybody, you, you have amazing friends and you have had amazing celebrity wearers. I think in the time before, the concept of celebrity endorsement was probably a lot less important, although I hate the word celebrity. Style icon, whatever. Today, who would you love who hasn't worn your things before? Who are you, your kind of cultural icons now who you'd you know, love to be in your shoes? I, I was never like that in the old it days. It, it, doesn't, it didn't really bother you. It no, wasn't it, that you. wasn't the point. And in the old days, you know, silly, silly me, before Tamara Mellon went to the Oscars and gave away a thousand pairs and changed the face of fashion, how uh, visionary was that? But I mean, I remember being at parties at the Oscars in LA and being surrounded by starlets did you come with shoes? I went, yeah, I'm a tranny. I travel with women's shoes. What? <laughs> I mean, I was just, just, why would I have a suitcase full of women's shoes? It just didn't even, even think. And the whole idea of gifting just didn't, it, gifting is giving free shoes to celebrities, by the way. There's a word for it now. Uh, and, There's a you word know, for just, it. There are whole companies just, for it. You know, are you going to do this? And are you going to do that? And before the days in style or TMZ, the photograph of a celebrity was here. So you either did the next one. or you did their earrings or you did their hair or their makeup. The shoes were way down there. They, they never were in the picture. They were cropped every single time. And I remember bands calling me up or, I mean, we famously charged Madonna retail because I was like, what? There's the shoes, go buy them, you're rich. I just didn't understand it. <laughs> I just, just <laughs> and this whole, I mean, this is, I get confrontational on this one, but this job stylist. The richest people in the world with all the money, can't they go shopping on their own? I, I just, I didn't, I didn't get that. I understand now that you get, there's a 24 hour news cycle and you get photographed three, four times a day and that must be exhausting to buy clothes all the time. But to me, how hard can it be to just go shopping? Do you, do you think it's important for a brand today, because you're such an observer of culture and of the zeitgeist, 
But do you think it's important for a brand today to have some kind of a celebrity presence, or do you think it's completely it's irrelevant for you or for anyone? Because the times have changed so much. I, I think it's what you're aiming for. If you're aiming for that blast, that, that buzz, that whatever, then yes, it's part of the game. Um, the, the only celebrity that I dream of wearing my shoes is the Queen. I mean, it's never going to happen. <laughs> for the, for the uh, last Jubilee, I even wrote a letter. I got the, the name of the lady who's in charge of the wardrobe. I didn't even get an answer. I think she probably just Googled me and freaked out. <laughs> Based on some of those ads you were looking at earlier. Yeah, and I exactly. tried to be, and I said, don't yeah. worry, I'll do something age appropriate, which I really regret writing in the letter. <laughs> I, I, I meant regal. I don't, I don't even know the words I wrote in the letter. They're all wrong and will all come back to haunt me. <laughs> okay, okay, so the Queen or nothing. The that's queen great. or nothing, yeah. That's great. That's just, that shows Dare. Set the, set the standard. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, well, we're, we're, we're coming towards the end, so we're going to open up for audience Q&A. If you want to ask Patrick a question, someone's going to come with a microphone. You just have to raise your hand and they will come and bring you um, a microphone. And we've got kind of time for, well, we've got quite, we've got sort of 10 minutes for questions. So ask away. Anyone, anyone? It's always the first. There we are. We have one hand there, please. Thank you for a lovely evening. From the way you describe it, it sounds as though luck plays a really big part in the way that your career has evolved. You know, being in the toilets, somebody saying, can you do the shoes? Oh, that you sounds know. really bad. But, yeah. <laughs> but how much would you say is luck and how much of it would you say is you kind of at least thought about it, planned about it, had a sense of direction for where you wanted your career to go? Very good question. I would say then and what it was in the 80s, I mean, Everybody, you know, it's very much in the beginning who you know. But everybody will give you a chance because they like you and they think you're nice. But if you don't deliver, you're out. I'm quite flippant, as you might have noticed, and I tend to denigrate what I've done. But obviously, there's a lot of hard work gone into the 30 year career I have. But there is an element of luck always in anybody's career. But now I think if you look at British Fashion Week at what it was in the 80s, and it stopped several times, and what it is now, it's, it's a different thing. I mean, there's so much more money behind it. The, the, the designers are so much more successful, so much more professional. Uh, it, it is, it is a, it's an industry now, and it's recognized as an industry, and it should be an industry because it has a huge turnover. But back then, we were deemed sort of crazy artists, things like that. And, and there was a lot more. I mean, I think for me personally, I was obviously younger, there was a lot more fun back then. Thank you. Anyone? Come on. Anyone else? Hi, Petra. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, working for Geox, how do you um, get your creative juices flowing? I mean, it's the easiest thing in the world. The, the thing about Geox is it has this technology where there's holes in the soles that lets the foot breathe. So that's it. It's not like I have to incorporate anything orthopedic or strange or make any compromises. There are certain levels that you think, oop, this is a bit too fashion for something that's available in 175 countries. But otherwise, you know, I let them edit the collection mostly. It's, it's, it's the easiest thing. And also, they work so ahead because the mass market is so quicker. So I've already finished winter 2016 for JOX. And tomorrow morning, I fly to Italy to start Lathbridge 2016. So it's a good something to get my juices going, think about things, and then also realize there's all these things that are just irrelevant for them. So you don't see any limitations? Um, limitations in just that I'm not allowed to use crocodile, I'm not allowed to use real fur, I'm not allowed to use python, um, you know, just limitations on that. And also limitations on shape, you know, you don't do stilettos for a company that is known for comfortable shoes, you know, so things like that. But it's really been a great training ground for me because for sneakers now dominate the market. Sneakers are 50% of Harrods or Selfridges footwear turnover, which I was very surprised when I started to sell to them. And sneakers are a big part of what I've learned at Jayox. Um, we used to do sneakers in the old days, but they were made in a traditional shoe factory, so they had no performance elements to them. So that's been really good, learning that. And I've definitely brought some of that over to what I'm doing with Lathbridge. Thank you. Thank you. 
think the Queen might like a pair of sneakers. <laughs> I think if you go back to them now and tell them what you're doing, I think the coronet. Like yeah, exactly, exactly. Any more questions? Hello. Um, I was going to ask. I mean, I live in East London now, and it was interesting hearing what you were saying about the difference sorry, between sorry. where you were living and yeah. And actually, now it's almost the feeling of if people walk around, say, somewhere like Bethnal Green that you were saying, and you're not wearing a crazy outfit and look like a fashion student, they look at you in a weird way and think, yeah. why are you here? So it's interesting to hear the way, you, it'd be interesting to know how you think it's changed. And with, yeah, with I mean, you, it's changed beyond recognition. Do you I mean, still have that? I mean, it's, it's so, kind of had, I don't know if anyone knows the South Bronx, but early rap videos, it was bomb, block after block of sort of leveled buildings, um, all those famous labor is not working campaigns, you know, to get Margaret Thatcher in power and things like that was going on at the time. It was, it was, yeah, it was bleak. It was very, very, very bleak and coming from somewhere. I remember when I told my mum I was moving to England, she's like, why? It's old and dirty. And I went, those are the two reasons I'm moving. Because where I'm from, it became a city in 1905. There is nothing old and dirty. So that was kind of the thrill. So do you still have a love affair with London then? Do I ever go east? Never. <laughs> I don't cross Tottenham Court Road. <laughs> when I get invited to Shoreditch House, I was like, if you're laying on a chopper, I might think about it. But <laughs> I did that east thing, and I'm not interested. No, thanks. <laughs> where, does, where do you get your inspiration now for Lethbridge and your own life? Are you going to the movies? Are you downloading things on Netflix? Are you reading books? Are you going to the b and all, all of the above. All of the above. Um, I've... You guys are really picky. You need to make an appointment six months in advance <laughs> to get into the archive. And I'm never thinking about shoes that far in advance. So I've never been into the archives, archives, and had the white gloves on and tried things and looked at things, which I'd really, really like to do. Because, yes, I've got things on the permanent display, but I pretty well know the permanent display off by heart. This exhibition was amazing because there were things I've seen, but you've got to understand it. It's a bit train spottery when you're a shoe designer, and there's a, only a certain amount out there. So pretty well everything I'd seen, maybe, but it's nice to get closer to it. Um, I became creative director of Charles Jordan oh, for yeah. about three years in, in the 2000s, and Charles Jordan has an incredible collection of André Perugia shoes. When people ask me who the greatest designer of shoes is, to me it's André Perugia. Uh, gone in 1945, no one knows anything about him, but more than Ferragamo to me, he invented every single type of footwear that there is. Um, and they had everything. They had one foot in the museum in Roman and the other foot in the factory. And that was amazing the three years that I was there because I got to hold them and touch them and look at them wearing gloves the whole time. Because to me, it's very tactile. As I said, I don't like my drawing skills. So for me, holding a shoe, holding a last, holding a heel is the most important thing. Okay. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Lady up there, thank you. Evening, Patrick. If you were invited back as a guest speaker to your old college, what would you say to the students? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I would gladly go. What would I say? Um, be true to yourself. Establish the styles very quickly very, and stay to it. Because if you see who's successful today, they kind of do the same thing over and over again. That's, that's the point of being successful. You find your niche and you repeat it. I think I kind of didn't get that memo, so I just kept doing new things every season. And I think I probably confused people a little bit between Wannabe and Patrick Cox and this and that. Um, learn to talk in sound bites, which I'm not very good at. Um, learn Italian, probably if you want to do luxury shoes. And if not, then, I don't know, Mandarin or something. But learn a second language because very little footwear is made in England. So you do need to have a way of communicating with someone. And it's all very interesting to send lots of emails and go through translators, but to actually talk to someone. And then what I would say is, most importantly, pay attention to the finance. Because to think you're like a designer in a gilded cage, that cage will very quickly turn into a prison if you don't pay attention to the finance. You really do need to know a balance sheet, a spreadsheet. You do need to know margins, markups. You do need to know what's going on. because. It's a business, it's not an art. Unless you have rich parents or you just want to make one shoe every five years, there's a, a business and that, that's not a fault, but you need to perform. So I think be true to yourself, finance, and learn a language. Okay, great, one more question and then we might end on that because that was really good. Anyone else? Anyone, anyone? We just have one there. Uh, 
Um, the reason I'm here tonight is that I, I own a, a pair of Patrick Cox I love very much. Yeah. And um, I bought them vintage many years ago, and I think I have them repaired five times already. I just wonder, do you still remember if I describe them, which year they... <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Okay, how you describe them and how I describe them, because people go, it's a shoey thingy with a heel, I'm like, great. But go ahead, let's go. They, they are a natural snake skin. Okay. They have a round front. Right. They have a um, thing around the ankle to hold right. it, while they're very good for dancing, and they have a block, quite a high block. Um, and does the label say wannabe or Patrick Cox? Patrick Cox. And they're very good for dancing. And they're very good for dancing. Uh, I mean, I, I have to say, as a woman, this is really crucial. I mean, thank you for... I can't give you the, the exact year, but I'd say late 90s. I would say probably 98, something like that. 99. Oh, yeah. I need to see a picture. They're my favorite. That is the interesting now. I am now vintage. <laughs> <laughs> Before walking down Portobello used to be interesting. Now I'm vintage. <laughs> okay. On that note, and we will thank you very much all for coming, and thank you to a vintage Patrick Cox. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. Thank, you. thank you very much for coming, and thank you to Patrick and Kinvara for an excellent talk. Thank you for all your questions, and please join us downstairs.